This week, in the shop, I'm building nothing except knowledge. That's right. You know, you guys leave comments in the video section below and you think I don't look at them, but I do, even though I might not have time to always respond, I read them. And some of the comments I've been getting lately have been asking if I will do a video sharing some wisdom or knowledge on starting your own woodworking business. And first I read the comments and said, <laughs> That's stupid, I'm not doing that. But then I thought about it more and thought that's a brilliant idea. Why don't I go ahead and make that happen? So in this video, I'm gonna share my top 10 tips for starting your own woodworking business. So follow along, learn something, and by the end of this video, you'll probably be pretty tired and sleepy and ready for a nap. But hopefully you'll also know a little bit more about starting and running your own woodworking business. Let's go. All right, so you started a woodworking business and you need clients. Like every business does because clients are the people that pay you to actually make the stuff. But how do you find them? Where do you get clients? How do you land them? Although there's no one answer for this, clients come from a lot of different sources, there are a few tips that I learned in running my own business that I'm happy to share. Number one, metal fabrication businesses. Eh? Yeah, it sounds weird, but if you're a woodworker, go find some local metal fab shops in your area. Let them know that you're a woodworker, and if any clients are asking about woodwork, to let you know. The reason being, these metal fab shops, people come in all the time and they ask for cool metal table bases or metal desk bases, all that sort of thing. But what metal fab shops don't do is woodworking. So what are these people gonna need? They need slab tops or wood components to go with the metal. So I found a couple local shops in my area. I put my name in, I dropped off some business cards and they were a great source of clients. They were constantly doing collabs with me, people wanting metal bases with wood tops. It was awesome and a good revenue source. I almost forgot. Another good one is interior designers. Find some local interior design firms in your area, put your name in, show them some pictures of things that you've made, and I promise they'll be your friend forever. See, customers come to the interior designers to do a space, and lots of times they need custom pieces to perfectly fit a certain area in the house. Well, interior designers don't always know custom furniture makers, so if you can get your name in with an interior designer, well, there's gonna be a lot of revenue source there. Towards the end of my custom furniture career, before I started doing content full-time, I was probably getting 70% of all custom pieces directly from interior designers. And here's a little trick I'll tell you. A lot of people don't think about this, but if someone can afford to hire an interior designer, well, they can afford to spend a lot more money on furniture. Huh? Picking up what I'm dropping? Well, hey, I was just pretending to cut something over here on the miter saw to make the video more legitimate. Another good thing to think about is having a second revenue stream. Now, this can be hard to think about when you're doing custom furniture, you're so laser focused on big pieces. But what happens if there's a lull in your client work? What if people aren't ordering big pieces for a while? You should always have something else that's bringing in at least a little bit of money. When I first started out, I wasn't even doing furniture. I was doing small items like this six pack beer holder. I made a zillion of these at the beginning and I would sell them online on Etsy or in local shops around the area. Now I continued to do small items for a long time after I made the switch to furniture for a couple reasons. One, it was extra income that was somewhat stable. Two, it put me in a lot of local shops and people, not knowing anything about woodworking, see anything made of wood and can just assume that you can build anything out of wood. So they'd see these and be like, oh, you do woodworking. Can I order three dining room tables? 
Believe me, it happens. So always be thinking about a second revenue stream, small items, little shelves, cutting boards, something like that. It's just good to have on the back burner in case you need that income to get you through the hard times. You always wanna be cautious of what you wear to a client's house. What you wear is a direct reflection of the professionalism of your business. So be mindful of how you present yourself to other people. Now this outfit might be appropriate for church, but it's probably not the best outfit for the job site. Let's talk about scheduling out your builds. Now this is one that trips up a lot of people when they first start out and if you don't schedule your builds right, it can make your life so much more stressful than it needs to be. You see, what a lot of people do is when a client comes and orders a piece of furniture, they give them a date. Your piece will be done by July 30th. Don't do this. All that that's going to do is make your life crazy stressful as you try and meet one date after the next date after the next date. Here's what you're going to want to do, or at least what I did, and it made life so much better. Tell people that you have a build list, that they're on it, and tell them what number they are on the list. Maybe you can let them know a week in advance. All right, you're next on my list. Tell them you will get to their piece in the order in which it is received. This frees up your life to work on the piece, get it done, and when it's done, it is done. Believe me, clients that order custom furniture are happy to wait for a good quality piece. So stop giving them a hard date. Just tell them they're 27th on the list and let them know the week before you start working on their piece. Trust me, it'll change your life. Another tip that I have for starting your own business is to take care of yourself. Which is why I'm glad to announce that this video was sponsored by Hone Health. Now, what is Hone Health, you might ask? That's a great question. Did you know that testosterone levels have decreased substantially over generations? In fact, our father's generation had testosterone levels that were 25% higher than what ours are on average. And 30 million men in America suffer from low testosterone and it's affecting their lives. And that's where Hone Health comes in. Now, I know what you're thinking. Testosterone, isn't that the sex hormone? Well, it is true that increased testosterone can help your sex drive, but it goes beyond that. Optimizing your testosterone levels can help with increased energy, muscle mass, it can even improve your mood. Now, Hone helps men get the treatment and testing that they need using real science, real physicians, and real FDA-approved methods. The best way to know if you need to optimize your testosterone is to be tested, and Hone makes it insanely easy to do so from the comfort of your own home with their easy assessment test. You get this, you open it up, all the instructions are inside, it tells you exactly what you need to do. There's a little finger prick, you just poke, don't worry, it doesn't hurt that bad. Dab a little on the card that's included, there's a prepaid envelope, you pop it in there, you send it off, and you get your results. Then Hone takes a look at those results and they hook you up with real physicians that'll walk you through a plan, get it in place so that you can optimize your testosterone and start feeling better. Listen, I'm not a medical expert, but Hone is, and they're gonna walk you through every step of the process. So here's what you're gonna wanna do. Get one of Hone's easy at-home assessment tests today. And here's a special offer. For all of my viewers, you can get the at-home assessment test and a physician consultation for just $45. That's $45 to optimize your health. Seriously, you don't wanna pass that up. Click the link in the video description or go to honehealth.com slash bourbonmoth. Get yours today, it's worth doing. And the finger prick really doesn't hurt that bad. I mean, I did it. On the note of scheduling out builds, let's talk about organizing your builds and the best way to do that. If you look up here, I have my calendar board of... I used to have calendars up here. Oh yeah, I don't do client work anymore. I have a clip of what this used to look like. Enjoy. Right next to my lathe, I have my calendar slash organization system. Basically, each job I have coming up gets a clipboard with all the pertinent information on it. 
and then each clipboard gets a tentative date on the calendar. Now, as you can see in that little clip, I had two months worth of calendars on a whiteboard. This would just help me organize my builds. Now remember, I'm not giving clients a specific date, but for my own mental knowledge, I wanna know kind of week to week what I'm hoping to get done. What I do do, <laughs> do do, is for each client, I would create a clipboard. Just buy a ton of clipboards. Each client gets a clipboard and I would create a client sheet. Here, I'll give you a chance to look at that. Now, I've purposely not filled out any of the personal information on this one because I don't want you to try and contact my clients. They're my clients. But each client would get a clipboard with a sheet, description of their job, all their information. And then I would hang these clipboards below my calendars and I would just work from one clipboard to the next to the next. This would just allow me to organize everything on a hard piece of paper. It's not floating around in an email inbox somewhere. Every time a client pays a deposit, their name goes on the clipboard and goes up on my wall. And then you just gotta work through them and build each piece. But while we're talking about deposits, let's talk about deposits. Some people I've talked to collect 10% down, 20% down. This is ridiculous. You should be collecting at least a 50% deposit for every single piece. And you should have written into the client contract that it is non-refundable. I would book jobs six months in advance. And sometimes people get cold feet, but if they put 50% down at the beginning, they're much less likely to back out towards the end. Meaning that you can count on the additional half of that income to actually come in once you get to their piece. 50% is not too much to ask. If you're asking for anything less, well, you're just selling yourself short. The other nice thing is by being booked months in advance and getting 50% down, you're always gonna have a constant stream of revenue coming in. If you're taking 10% down and then you spend three weeks to build a piece, well, there's a gap there where you're getting a little bit of money and then you're getting the rest at the end of the three weeks. 50% down, you're constantly gonna be having good sums of money coming in from deposit to finish piece to deposit to finish piece. It's just a better revenue stream. So think about it. If at all possible, don't poop in a client's home. One of the most common questions I get when it comes to running your own woodworking business is this, how do you price out pieces? How do you come up with the correct price to charge somebody for a piece of furniture? Now there's no easy answer for this. You're gonna have to figure out whatever works best for you, but I will tell you what I did and maybe it'll help. First, you take the cost of materials. Let's say $500, okay? Then you estimate out how many hours it's gonna take you to build that piece. Let's say 60 hours, all right? Then you assign an hourly wage that you're comfortable with. Let's say $65 an hour, all right? You times the 65 times the number of hours, add the material cost, that gives you a rough ballpark. But I always add an additional 15% on top of that just to cover any unexpected costs. You also want to think about adding delivery fees, installation fees. All those things are going to cost you extra time and money, and there is no reason that you should be out that without the client compensating you for it. So that's how I do it. But you can do whatever you want. Now, I know I already touched on how you find clients. I gave you a couple different ways to do that. But I will say the best way to get new clients is from your old clients. If you're making quality pieces and you put them in clients' homes, well, their friends and family members are gonna come over and say, hey, where'd you get that? And then they're gonna recommend you. So you wanna make sure to market yourself to your clients. And this is what I mean by that. Don't just show up at their house with their piece of furniture, drop it off and say goodbye. I like to put together a little care package to go with the piece of furniture. I drop off the piece and then I usually have a little muslin bag that's got my logo printed on it and it's full of about five to 10 business cards. I tuck that inside a custom printed bourbon moth coffee mug and I slap it on their counter. I make sure to let them know, hey, if you enjoy this piece and other friends are asking about it, give them my card. 
I got a ton of clients that way and it's an easy, cheap way to market yourself to your clients. Don't forget the gift bag. If you wanna get serious about starting your own woodworking business, I cannot stress enough buying quality materials. You're not gonna do very good for very long going to Home Depot or Lowe's and buying construction grade stuff and throwing together a trestle table. It might be a good way to get started, but believe me, if you want continual clients coming back to you time and time again, recommending your name to their friends, you wanna use quality goods. This also means you're gonna to have to charge more, but you can also make more. So ditch the pallet wood, stop pouring epoxy on everything like a freak, and go buy some good hardwood. If you're looking for a good place to buy hardwood lumber, just do a Google search, hardwood dealers near me. You're gonna find some great sources, and if you can't, look up some local cabinet shops. They're definitely getting their hardwood from someplace, and I'm sure they can give you a lead on where you can get it too. Ugh, pine. Whenever you're in a client's home, always ask permission before you open drawers. Now, I was at a client's house one time and they were asking me about a broken drawer and it didn't work right. And so without asking, I just opened it up to look at the slides and the drawer was full of lingerie. And it was really awkward because he lived all alone. So. A second, I'm looking at Instagram. If you're a woodworker and you're watching this video, well, it probably means you're also on social media because this is YouTube and that's a social media platform. My point is this. It probably means that as you grow your business, you're gonna be posting pictures of your stuff online for the whole world to see. You just have to remember that your clients can see what you post too. Now, this can be a really good thing and a really bad thing. It can be a bad thing in that you don't want to say anything negative about the piece you're building, the design of the piece if the client designed it, or anything bad about the client. It can be really good because it makes the client feel like more of a part of the build, which also means that you shouldn't just post pictures of the finished piece. Clients love watching the process. They love seeing how their piece was made and being part of that story. So when you're doing your social media for your business, don't just think about those beauty shots at the end. Make sure to post the process shots. They will do far more for the growth of your business than just the glamour shots at the, the very end of the build. <laughs> Cats. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I hope it was somewhat helpful for you. If you have more questions, maybe more detailed questions, Make sure to leave them in the comment section below. Even if I don't respond to you, I promise I'll try and read all of them. And maybe I'll do another one of these later on with some more tips. All right.